Space Watchers. This is the Space Cafe Radio. Your new Space Watch Global channel about trends, people and conferences. When our Space Watch team is on the road, we will talk with wonderful and inspiring humans and we will let you know all about the cool things they have to say. I'm Thorsten, publisher of Space Watch Global, and I had the chance to attend the Unidir Outer Space Conference end of September in Geneva at the UN. And it's always feels very special to be at the United Nations in Geneva. But if that wouldn't be exciting enough, I also had the great honor to talk with the UK ambassador and permanent representative of the Conference of Disarmament at the UK mission in Geneva, Aidan Little. Here's our interview. So, Mr. Ambassador, Ambassador Little, it's a great honor talking to you here at the 2021 Unity Airspace Security Conference. Let's start the UNGA Resolution 70. No, 5736. What? 7536. 7536, yeah. Let me clarify that. Sometimes you're getting a bit nervous about things. We are talking about a new initiative on outer space security at the United Nations General Assembly, the UNGA Resolution 7536. Reducing space threats through norms, rules and principles of responsible behavior. And it was tabled on 23rd October 2020 and voted on by the first committee in November 2020. The first committee will consider the report at its next session now in October 2021 and decide what to action it wants to take as a next step. And that is happening now. Back to the talk. Was part of many discussions during the conference so far. Can you... Please clarify on that, on space debris and weapons in space. So what is it about for a broader audience which are not trained diplomats? So our resolution is about trying to come up with a new approach to dealing with the old problem of outer space security. Outer space security has been on the agenda of the United Nations for decades, but obviously space is uh, a very fast evolving domain. It's changing a lot. There are new actors involved. There are new technologies. The space is becoming increasingly congested, contested. And while the UN machinery has been deadlocked for several years on this question, the problems that are mounting in space are ever more urgent. So our resolution was an attempt really to try and break the deadlock by proposing a, a new approach. So it's a different angle. It's it's not competing with any other approach. It's not, we're not forcing people to make a choice, but it is something we hope that might lead to a breakthrough in dealing with this problem. Can you go a bit more into the details of that? Traditional approaches to outer space security have taken what we might call a top-down approach. They've said that the end goal should be a treaty, a legally binding instrument, which should be comprehensive and cover all the different problems in outer space. Now, as I said, the problems in outer space are much more complicated than they were 40 years ago when this approach first started taking shape. There are a lot more actors involved, there are a lot more technologies This is a problem that faces every state on Earth. It's not just those states who have objects in, in outer space or who can launch objects into outer space. All of our societies now rely much more heavily on space systems for our prosperity as well as our security. So we felt we needed something that was much more inclusive, something that was uh, much more flexible, that could look at different aspects of the problem in uh, ways appropriate to those problems and that was agnostic really about the solution that looked at the problem from a ground up perspective because that's the only way really we're going to be able to address the problems that we can see. So what is the current status of the resolution right now and does it feel for you as well that the sound of the entire discussion changed? Yes, I think it did. So as I say, all, all of this is under the rubric of preventing an arms race in outer space. That's the objective that the UN has had for many years. But I think over time, people tend to equate preventing an arms race in outer space with a particular initiative that was here at the conference on disarmament on preventing the placement of weapons in outer space. Now, that is certainly a concern for some countries, but I think it's not. It's far from the whole story. And really, these days, we see threats to space objects coming from other objects in outer space. We see threats from the Earth. We see threats such as directed energy weapons or cyber attacks or electronic warfare. It's not just a question of of placing missiles on orbit, which is perhaps what it seemed as it might be in the 1970s or 1980s. So our resolution, we ran it for the first time last year in 2020, and the idea of behind that resolution was to ask states to study these problems from this 
new angle and to give their views to the UN Secretary General who would then compile a report. Now that report was published back in July and it gives a really already really rich picture of the different threats that different states can see and some of the different solutions that we might approach from a behaviour based approach rather than the classical arms control objects based approach that the previous initiatives have, Mm -hmm. have focused on. And you just mentioned on the panel that uh, the upcoming months will be very exciting and very intense of in this discussion and bringing that to New York, is that correct? That's right. So as I said, last year was the first time we ran this resolution just to es- establish the new concept and, as I say, to give states the, the, the chance to feed in their views to the Secretary General. So this year, on the back of that report, we're proposing that we take the discussion to a next level. So our resolution this year will create an open-ended working group, which is a, a subsidiary body of the General Assembly. It includes all UN member states and international organisations. And the idea of this working group is that it will discuss over the next two years these questions in, in a lot greater detail. It'll try to establish a baseline of what law and what norms already are expected in space. It will try and get a common understanding of the threats that we see to outer space security. And then finally, it will hopefully come up with a a list of areas in which this responsible behaviours framing might lead to some solutions. Yesterday was another exciting day for the UK, I hope. So how does the new release, the UK space strategy, will play into this discussion? of norms. So yes, the, the outer space strategy is has been a long time in the making and we're very pleased that it's now published. The idea behind the strategy is that it, it really is a, a cross-government piece of work. So of course the defence security aspect is very important to it, but it's also about how we maximise our advantage in the commercial space sector, how we make sure that the industry in the UK has the skills it needs and, and the education uh, underpinning all of that. So it really is looking at how the UK operates in space right across the board. But I was also very pleased in particular that the strategy did did mention the work that we're doing here and it recommitted to that work. So it's something that really has the the full weight of the British government behind it, which which is very exciting. So what exactly could be subject to norms such as the anti satellite test, the guidelines, safety zone or what else? So there's a whole range of things that this could contribute to. So as I say, the previous approaches to this have concentrated on objects. And that's what we do really in arms control diplomacy is we try and define objects and then we try to either count them or, or prohibit them or restrict them in some way. Now, in, in space, that approach really can't work, or at least not for very long, because it's very difficult to tell what the capability of an object is in space once it's in orbit. A lot of objects are, of course, dual use. They could be either for perfectly benign, peaceful purposes, or they could be used to interfere with other space objects. So our approach, as I say, is about behaviours rather than objects. And really, you can use this framing to deal with all sorts of problems that, that you see in space security. ASAT, direct and kinetic ASAT weapons, absolutely, you can use this approach to look at that, and you can talk about how you might use these techniques responsibly or irresponsibly, in Particularly, the question about uh, deliberate creation of debris is a very is one which is very important to a lot of states, I think. But you can also use this framing to discuss how we behave on orbit in terms of rendezvous and proximity operations. You can talk about it in terms of how we use the data links between satellites, whether it's okay or not to interfere with data links between satellites and ground stations, whether it's okay to disrupt imaging from satellites or to blind satellites which are there for imaging purposes. And again, all of this will be context specific, which is why it's so important to have this approach as a framing. This is about having conversations between states about what's okay and what's not okay, what's potentially dangerous and escalatory. Taking a wider view, however that is possible, what are the UK's ambitions for space sustainability and space security at large? They're two sort of separate issues as far as the UN is concerned, but they're obviously linked as well. So my colleagues in Vienna obviously are working very hard in the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space to implement the long-term sustainability guidelines that were agreed there a couple of years ago. And obviously there's a lot more work to do on that and it's important that we continue working on that to make sure that space is safe and sustainable for commercial actors, for new space-faring nations and for, for everybody. Here in Geneva and, and at the First Committee in New York, we're more focused on the security aspects. So making sure that states are able to guarantee the integrity of their space systems, which we rely on for our security and our prosperity. But we have to make sure that the, these approaches are joined up as well. The problem of debris, of course, is primarily an issue for Vienna and how we operate safely and sustainably in space. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you deliberately blow up a satellite, that creates debris. So there are definitely links across the two agendas. Thank you very much for your time and for this interview. Thanks for having me. What an exciting talk. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for our next Space Cafe radio episode.
In the meantime, visit our website, our mothership, at spacewatch.global. And of course, don't forget to become a Space Watcher. I'm Thorsten Greening, CEO and publisher of spacewatch.global, your independent perspective of space. Thank you.